Shabbat Shalom and welcome. I'm excited to share with all of you that in the Browse Lighthouse, we are going to be getting milkweed this coming week. And I'm so excited about that. Um, I've been waiting a year for the milkweed and utzing David about it um, pretty much weekly um, because just over a year ago, in one of the last meetings that I had before the pandemic, I was sitting in a cafe, which is something that we used to do. We used to sit in cafes and have meetings with people um, with an incredible woman, a new friend. And she and I started talking about the monarch butterfly shortage. Like so many of the devastating effects of climate change, milkweed, which is the only thing that monarch butterflies eat, is becoming scarce uh, all around the world right now because of excessive land development and, and because of the overuse of weed killer. And I'm sure there are other factors as well. Meanwhile, without milkweed, the monarchs will go extinct. So, um, so my friend and her kids decided that they were going to do their part to help. So they planted milkweed in front of their house and they started to watch every day as it became a haven for monarch butterflies. And, and since then, I've heard Rabbi Artson and Alana speak about their own adventures with milkweed. And every time I hear someone talk about it, I'm so eager to get my own and to get started. And so I've been thinking about why it is that there's this kind of cultural obsession with milkweed, um, or maybe it's just uh, among, among my few strange friends. Um, but I think it's really clear why we're so invested in the Monarch Butterfly Revival Project. And it's not only because monarch butterflies are these beautiful, magical creatures, and it feels like literally the least we can do to help reverse course on some of the destruction that human greed and recklessness has wreaked on the creatures with whom we share at this planet. It's not only because this is one small way that we can take action and there will be a, really an immediate visible impact on the world, but it's also because these butterflies are, are just wondrous because the journey from caterpillar to butterfly can take even the, the greatest cynic's breath away. And I think perhaps, especially in this time of pandemic, there's something so profoundly relatable about a creature that needs to go fully into herself in order to self-actualize, in order to come out the other side ready to soar. And that's what I wanna think about with you for a few moments this morning. So today we're gonna to read um, Parshat Kitisa from the book of Exodus. This is the, the Parsha, the Torah portion that tells the sorry tale of the golden calf. It reveals our people's failure to hold their faith when Moses delays in, re in returning from the mountaintop where he's convening uh, with God and having this incredible divine revelation. But, but what I want to talk about today is something that happens before the incident of the golden calf, before the people gather up against Aaron, Moses' brother, and demand of him that he make them gods that will replace Moses, who seems to have abandoned them. This is before Aaron tosses all their gold jewelry into the fire and a, and a calf emerges, unmatched for thousands of years in its hideous ill conceit until another golden idol, testament to another false god, would traverse the halls of CPAC at the Hyatt Regency in Orlando last week. But this is before all of that happened. God has plans for this people, newly freed from enslavement in Egypt. God wants this people to build something holy in the world, a sacred space, a mishkan, that would be a resting place for the divine presence as they travel through the desert. And God has got just the architect to build such a place. So here's what the text says. Re'e karati v'shem b'tzalel ben Uri ben Hur l'mate Yehuda. Pay attention, God says. I am calling by name B'tzalel, son of Uri, son of Hur from the tribe of Judah. I have endowed this person with a divine spirit, with wisdom, with insight, with knowledge. He is a master of every kind of craft. That's what God tells Moses. Through him, through B'tzalel, this holy place will be built. And as exceptional as B'tzalel is, there are two really important things that you should know about him that make his brilliance even more remarkable. Two things that I never thought about until this year. 
First, the rabbis in Masechet Sanhedrin tell us that at the time that Betzalel was chosen by God, he was a 13-year-old child. Abby, I want you to think about that for a moment. He was a bar mitzvah boy. His voice was still cracking. But already in his short life, he had acquired the wisdom and the sensitivity to realize the holy aspirations of our people in physical form. We chose a 13-year-old architect to lead the most important building project our people would ever take on, or really God chose. And even more remarkably, this part of the story takes place only a few months after B'Tzalel and all of the people left enslavement in Egypt, which means this young person, this kid, his entire life had been spent in enslavement in Egypt. And when he and when the people finally emerge, only a couple of months later, he is tasked with and he's able to achieve the most magnificent work of art, the creation of the Mishkan. So how is this even possible? And what in the world are we supposed to learn from this? So I wanna say that now one year into this pandemic that has absolutely turned our lives upside down, that has robbed us of our health, for some of us, our loved ones, our faith in American democratic systems, our sense of stability and security and certainty about the future. This pandemic that's kept us from our families and our friends and our community and supplanted our routines and frankly, cemented our addiction to and our complete and utter dependence on these screens and devices and planted deep within us a pervasive, irrepressible sense of fear and anxiety. Some days, given all of that, it's a miracle that we can even get out of bed. We don't have to be heroes in this time. Some days it's heroic to simply be alive, right? Am I right about that? And yet at the same time, I'm so struck by the message of God's choice of B'Tzalel as the architect of holiest spaces. What a wonder that a person who has known only suffering and oppression in his life could muster such unmatched imagination. Someone raised in the narrowest of constraints is still somehow able to dream the most expansive possibilities. And it makes me wonder, could this time that we have all lived through also open us up to what might be possible? What if all of this pain all of this isolation and death and illness and constriction could awaken in us our most audacious imagination about our lives, about this country, about the world. I know that at least two of you have written and completed books in the last year. That's absolutely incredible. Not only have I not written a book in the last year, but the stack of books by my bedside has, has like given birth to mini baby stacks of books by my bedside. And I find it harder and harder to even read a book, let alone write a book, more than a couple of pages a day most days. I, I, I read about an exhibit at the MoMA right now called Making Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And, and it's an exploration of creativity in confinement. It tells the story of incarcerated artists who had limited material, limited space, limited freedom, and yet they were able to create beauty. The works that, that, are, that are up in this exhibit, one journalist said, they testify to the stirring possibilities of generative constraint. The stirring possibilities of generative constraint. And that's absolutely incredible to me. But that's not even what I'm asking of us. I'm not asking what we're producing in this time. I'm asking who we are allowing ourselves to become in this time. But Salal didn't make art until after he emerged from all of the constraints of Egypt. But while he was in it still, he was preparing. He filled himself up with Ruach Elohim, with the divine spirit, with Chochma and Tvuna and Da'at, with wisdom and insight and knowledge. Rashi helps us understand that the Torah is not just being redundant or just using synonyms here, but there's actually a distinction between each of these three things that Betzalel possessed. Wisdom, that's what we learn from other people. Insight, that's what we glean if we pay attention to ourselves 
after we receive all the inputs from the world, if we're quiet enough to listen to our own hearts and knowledge, that's Ruach HaKodesh. That is acquired by God. In 1972, shortly before he died, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was famously asked this question, what is your message to the young people? And he said the following. He said, every little deed counts and every word has power and everything we do, every one of us can be our share in working to redeem the world in spite of all its absurdities and all of its frustrations and all of its disappointments. But then he said, above all, remember that the meaning of life is to build life as if it were a work of art. The meaning of life is to build life as if it were a work of art. How do you do that? If we listen to B'Tzalel, the holiest of artists, it's not necessarily buying the paint and taking out the blank canvas and starting. That's gonna come later. Maybe we're not ready for that yet. For now, we start by training our hearts to receive the chokhmah and the tvuna and the da'at, the wisdom and the insight and the knowledge. I actually think this would be an incredible and worthy exercise, friends. Take after Shabbat, take a blank piece of paper and write on it these three words, chokhmah, tvuna and da'at, wisdom, insight and knowledge. What are we learning from each other? What are we learning from ourselves? And what are we learning from the Holy One? The ambitious ones among us will actually try to fill this, this chart out. You'll add lessons to each of the three columns. I know the people who wrote the books during pandemic will do that. But the rest of us, maybe we'll just put that piece of paper beside our beds or our computers. A reminder to keep our hearts open in this time, to listen deeply, to pay attention, because the lessons are there. Something's being stirred up in us right now even though we can't always see it. Something that if we're open to it, could turn into a work of art one day, if only we allow it to. So, so this takes me back to the milkweed, which I can't wait to plant in front of our house in the next few days. I can't wait to do my small part to help create a more welcoming habitat for the monarch butterflies. But what I'm gonna pay extra attention to is not what comes out of the cocoons, but what's happening inside them. The very process of transformation itself or what Sam Anderson wrote about in the New York Times Magazine last spring, precisely the part of the story that tends to be skipped, the confinement, the waiting, the darkness, the change. Because we all of us have lived this past year through confinement and waiting and darkness and change. And Sam Anderson explains that once a caterpillar actually enters the chrysalis, a cataclysmic event occurs. It essentially digests itself using enzymes, he says, to reduce its body to goo, turning itself into soup of X caterpillar. He says, this, this near total self annihilation is what has to happen before the new growth can begin. And that's how you get a butterfly out of the horrid meltdown of a modest caterpillar. <laughs> David and I have been talking about this article for a year, caterpillar goo. And only after the near total self annihilation, do you get the metamorphosis. Great changes are happening within each one of us. And they're happening all around the world. What Anderson calls acts of internal self-destruction and rebuilding, subtle shifts and whole revolutions. I have great dreams for us. You know that I have high hopes for what we're gonna build on the other side together. For now, for right now, I pray that we use this time to pry open our hearts and ingest the lessons of the narrow place that we're still in like B'Tzalel did amidst the crushing harshness of enslavement. Only then will we be prepared to leave this time, not only transformed, but equipped to transform our society. Only then might, meet, might we become the artists that the world needs to paint a new reality in this time and for generations to come. Only then might we be ready to make our lives into a work of art. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom.